let me uh, sort of outline for you what, what I'm going to talk about here. You know, the IGNRP guidelines are the predominant guidelines that we have in the EU and in this country and in various other countries around the world, with certain specific exceptions. And, uh, and they're very similar also to the US FCC safety guidelines and the Canadian guidelines, although those do differ in, in detail. Um, they're all based on uh, this idea of uh, averaging exposures over six minutes, or in some cases even longer times, 30 minutes. And what I'm going to discuss is the fact that when you examine um, quantitative data on whether the safety guidelines, the ICNRP safety guidelines, the, which are the same, as I say, the EU and the um, um, Estonian safety guidelines, and you ask, do they predict biological effects, and therefore, do they predict safety? And the answer is no, 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 over and over and over again. They fail. The safety guidelines fail. So, and they fail in very interesting and important ways. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on that failure. And I'm also going to relate that failure to what kinds of things we expect from 5G specifically. Okay? So, um, uh, okay, so... Uh, that's that's basically those basically are the things that I'm going to talk about. So um, this is the uh, let's see the uh, ICNRP safety guidelines in this range from 100 kilohertz to 10 gigahertz, uh, which is most of what we're what we're concerned about here. And uh, and there 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 are several things about this. First of all, for whatever reason, the occupational exposures. Uh, are are five times greater that are allowed. It's not really clear why that is, because people who are occupationally exposed don't really have control over the exposures, and they don't really have good ways to protect themselves from those exposures, just because they're occupationally exposed. Uh, nor do they volunteer to be exposed high, at higher levels. But um, then we have the general public uh, levels. And uh, the other thing which is true is that the localized levels, that is where you have, in this case, uh, head and trunk levels or, or other, other uh, uh, or, or the limbs, for some reason they have different, you know, much higher exposure levels. We know that many of these effects occur at the cellular level. And the, there's no reason why the individual cells of a particular type are going to be less sensitive just because, you know, you're looking at localized exposures um, as opposed to whole body exposures. So there are a number of things about this that are immediately questionable based on, on the structure of it. Uh, the other thing which is true as, as, uh, is that these are averaged exposures over, in this case, six minutes. And it's not at all clear why they are or why anybody should think that average exposures actually predict biological effects. Um, and the... Allowable exposures are based on specific absorption rates, which is a measure of the heating of the tissues. So the only thing these things do is they protect from heating effects, from thermal effects. They do not protect from any other effects. They're not designed to protect from any other effects. And yet, the effects that we're most concerned about, obviously, are the non-thermal effects. And so, 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 you know, so, so these things are kind of irrational. And it, it, it's useful to understand the structure of these things. Uh, and in fact, it's essential to understand the structure of them in order to look at the issue of whether these safety guidelines predict biological effects and therefore safety. 
So um, I'm going to look, I'm going to talk about eight different types of highly repeated studies where we can ask the question, do these safety guidelines predict biological effects and therefore safety? So situations where we have good quantitative data and uh, that's been repeated over and over and over again. And so the first thing is we have a whole bunch of published review articles that uh, show that there are effects that occur at levels well below the safety guidelines over and over and over again. Important health-related effects. So there's lowered fertility. And these studies have been done both in, in animals and in humans. Uh, and, uh, and you get, uh, uh, in animals it's been shown, you get changes in the structure of the testis and the structure of the ovaries. And those are cumulative effects. That is, they, they are effects that occur that become more and more severe with time of exposure. Okay? So you have a particular kind of exposure, and it may have a modest effect in a short time, but you keep exposing and things get worse and worse. Okay? So you have cumulative effects. That's true of a number of the other effects that I'm going to talk about as well. And uh, so you get lowered sperm count, you get lowered sperm motility, you get l lowered sperm quality, uh, of other measures of quality. And by the way, you know, you can take, and there are quite a number of studies of this sort, where you can take human sperm samples and you can divide them in half and you can expose them to Wi-Fi radiation, to cell phone radiation, um, and uh, there's at least one thing where they actually looked at cell phone tower radiation. And what do you see? You see effects on the motility of the sperm. And, you, and, you, and in some cases, you also see other changes in sperm quality from the direct irradiation of human sperm. Now, when you have that, you know what's going on. You know what's causing, you know, you have a, a variable and it's causing these effects. So, you know, when people say, oh, nothing is established, it's complete and utter nonsense. And we know that radiation that we are exposed to, in fact, produce these kinds of effects. Um, and uh, so, okay, so what else? Uh, there is there is animal data where you get uh, lowered numbers of of follicles in the eggs. So, uh, sorry, the eggs, the follicles in the eggs are the same thing. So, you get uh, you know fewer eggs. So, so lowered female fertility. You also get increased spontaneous abortion. That's been reported both in humans and in animals. And uh, you get lowered levels of each of the three types of sex hormones. Estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone all go down. And uh, you get lowered libido. That's not surprising if the sex hormones drop. Um, there's also some, some uh, uh, reports that you get less, you get increased uh, amenorrhea. You get, you know, women stop menstruating as a function of, um, of exposures. That's kind of new data and hasn't been repeated as much. Um, so, okay, so, and so you get 25 reviews on this. There are 29 reviews on neurological and neuropsychiatric effects. And among the effects that are found are, are all of these things, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Uh, and, and what you see is that all these things which have become absolutely epidemic in our societies, we know are caused by... EMF exposures are different kinds of EMFs that we're commonly exposed to, and, uh, and, 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 and we have all of these effects that occur um, over and over and over again. Cellular DNA damage is another thing that's been repeated a lot. You get both single-strand and double-strand breaks in the cellular DNA and oxidized bases in the cellular DNA. And, uh, you know, when you get these at the cellular level, uh, they can have roles in causing cancer, of course. And uh, when you get these in the germline cells, 
and you do get them in human sperm, uh, what happens? You, you get germline mutations of various sorts, okay? And those sorts include um, chromosomal rearrangements, which are actually the earliest mutations that were ever studied in, in, uh, in response to these EMFs. We shown back in the 1950s, you get chromosomal rearrangements from, uh, from these exposures. And, uh, and you also get uh, copy number mutations from both the single-strand and double-stranded breaks. And then you get uh, what are called point mutations from the oxidized bases. All of these can have roles in, um, have important roles in human mutation. And when they occur at the cellular level, they can have important roles in causing cancer. So, um, so we know a lot about these. And uh, you also get apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And, uh, and that's been reported in 15 different reviews. This is important both for the reproductive effects and for neurodegenerative effects. We haven't talked about these yet. Uh, you get oxidized stress, oxidized, oxidative stress and free radical damage. 25 reviews on that. Uh, again, all of these now are at levels of exposure well below safety guidelines. Okay? Um, so you get endocrine effects. Uh, 15 reviews on that. As best I can determine, every single hormone system in the body is impacted. Um, not always the same way. Uh, and, and, how, and, and, and sometimes the impacts vary depending on how long people have been exposed and what the levels of exposure are. So um, you get excessive intracellular calcium, which is, I, I will tell you, is the cause of essentially everything else that we're going to talk about. So that's, that's very important. There are 38 reviews on, on cancer, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Dr. Hardell has published a number of the most important of these. Um, and uh, I, think, I think some of the ones uh, that I, I particularly like are the two, the two uh, reviews that, that he published showing that the, most of the Bradford Hill criteria are um, fulfilled by the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the studies of, of cancer causation. So the Bradford Hill criteria are the well-accepted criteria for distinguishing causation from chance association. And so was, those are very important criteria, and, and, and uh, he showed that they, they are fulfilled here with regard to uh, cancer causation by these EMFs. And, you know, and, and those findings are universally ignored by the regulatory agencies, uh, universally ignored, despite the fact that they are the well-accepted criteria that one uses in looking at epidemiological studies. So um, we also have cardiac effects on the electrical control of the heart. These are also life-threatening. There are nine reviews on that. And, uh, and, and uh, these also show cumulative effects. So you can get instantaneous tachycardia, rapid heartbeat, but typically bradycardia, which is slow heartbeat, only occurs when you've had long-term exposure. So you get cumulative effects on this. Um, and that they give you a different, a different kind of response. You also have arrhythmias. Arrhythmias, when they're associated with, particularly with bradycardia, are often associated with sudden cardiac death. About 5% of the deaths in the U.S. are caused by sudden cardiac death. And this number has been increasing uh, rapidly. And uh, we have um, epidemics of young, apparently healthy athletes dying in the middle of an athletic competition of sudden cardiac death. Um, I think the probable mechanism is what we're looking at here. Uh, you know, and that's something that seems to be universally ignored. Okay, so we have in total here 
among these, we have 197 bodies of evidence that in, 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 these, in these reviews that I've, I've shown you, each showing that EMF intensities well below safety guidelines produce health-related effects. And anyone who wants to argue that these things are not established effects needs to argue that each of these 197 bodies of evidence are deeply flawed. And of course, they don't do that. Um, they just simply ignore the evidence. That's where we are. Okay, now, um, so that's one set of data that basically says that the allowable levels from the safety guidelines are way too high, and in fact, we get many different effects at much lower uh, uh, intensities. Um, there's a second set of data here which says that pulsed EMFs are in most cases much more biologically active than non-pulsed EMFs, uh, also called continuous wave EMFs, of the same average intensity. And, uh, and so the pulsations are very important. And because all wireless communication devices communicate at least in part via pulsations, they are potentially, and I believe actually, much more dangerous. And in general, the smarter the device, the more they pulse, and therefore uh, uh, the more dangerous they will likely be. Um, and, and so, again, the safety guidelines are based on average intensities over a six-minute period. But what these data show is you cannot use average intensities to predict biological effects because the more pulsations you've got, the, the, the more effects you get at the same average intensity. So that's, that's a, a major issue. And as I said before, uh, you know, this is particularly important for the devices that we are exposed to. So almost everything we're exposed to is pulsed. And that's even true of radar, where you have phased arrays that, that uh, cause the, the impact on our bodies to be pulsed. Okay, so, um, so this is a very important issue. Now, 5G is designed to be extraordinarily highly pulsed. And the reason that that's true is because 5G is designed to carry gigantic amounts of information per unit time. And the way you do that is by having huge amounts of pulsations. So for that reason, we have every reason to expect that 5G will be especially dangerous. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, so now I'm going to talk about two other types of evidence later on that deal with the issue of pulsation, that bring up the issue of pulsation again. So uh, it's not just this data here. Um, so I think, you know, this is, this is a major issue that, you know, this is the way 5G is designed, and yet the safety guidelines completely ignore the issue of pulsation. You know, what's interesting is if you go back and you look in, 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 back in the 1980s, they were actually three countries in the world that have had more stringent safety guidelines for pulsed EMFs. And now, of course, we're infinitely dumber about this stuff. And, uh, and, and despite the fact that we have, or perhaps because of the fact that we have so many different exposures to highly pulsed uh, radiation here. Um, so, um, now, uh, let's see, okay. So, um, how are how are the non thermal effects produced? And this this is uh, this this is my own work, not my own my own um, experimental studies. But uh, these were studies in the literature that I that I compiled that tell us how how these things work. And um, so there there are twenty eight different studies that I've cited, and in fact I know about ten or twelve more that I haven't cited which uh, showed that, that uh, non-thermal effects of uh, microwave and other frequency EMFs can be blocked or greatly lowered by calcium channel blockers. These are drugs that are specific for blocking what are called voltage-gated calcium channels, or VGCCs. And so, um, and there are five different types of channel blockers that have been used here. 
Uh, they have different structures. Uh, they, at least to some extent, bind to different sites. And they're each thought to be highly specific. So, uh, so uh, and, and, and what's, what's, what else is important here is that when several effects were studied, when one was blocked or greatly lowered, each of them was also blocked and greatly lowered. And so what that argues is that this mechanism that is being blocked is a mechanism for many different effects, producing many different effects. And so what is this mechanism? Well, um, um, what we have here, these, these are channels in the plasma membrane, the membrane that surrounds each of our cells. And they have the property then that when they open up, which is what the, uh, what the EMFs do, they cause it to open up, you get huge amounts of calcium ions that flow into the cell. And it's the excess calcium in the cell then that's responsible for most, if not all, of the biological effects that are produced. And so, um, uh, and, and let me just say, normally in, uh, in, in, in the normal situation in our cells, there's about 10,000 times as much calcium outside the cell as in the cell. So there's a big chemical gradient driving calcium into the cell. And in addition to that, there's also an electrical gradient that also drives calcium in the cell. So there's huge forces driving calcium into the cell. What that tells you is, under normal circumstances, we spend a lot of energy keeping the calcium levels low in the cell. And that tells you it's important to keep the calcium levels low in the cell under most circumstances. You do let calcium in to regulate things, to, you know, and very briefly, and then it can get chucked out again. What happens when, when you're exposed to EMFs is you get, you get vast amounts of calcium shouldn't, that shouldn't be there, and that then causes lots of problems. So um, this is the basic pattern here, and it's produced, interestingly, by all the frequencies ranging from millimeter waves through microwave, radio frequencies, intermediate frequencies, extremely low frequencies from our power wiring, so 50 hertz and 60 hertz uh, in Europe and in the U.S., and, uh, and all the way down to static electrical fields and static magnetic fields, they can all work via um, this uh, VGCC. I, I didn't introduce that um, abbreviation, but I'm uh, calling these VGCCs so I don't have to read, you know, have to repeat all this stuff all the time. And uh, via VGCC activation. So um, now let me just say there are also other voltage gated ion channels that are also activated uh, by, by these EMFs, including the sodium channels, the potassium channels, and the chloride channels. And they're regulated in a very similar way. And that, that tells us something important. And it's also true that there are plant channels that are regulated in a similar way that allow calcium to flow into the plant cells. And it turns out in plants, the effects are quite, you know, the, 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 uh, um, uh, most of the uh, EMF effects, again, goes through uh, cal excessive calcium in the cell, in the plants. So uh, they're, they're structurally somewhat different, but they still have... Uh, so, okay, so um, we have various other kinds of evidence that, that shows that uh, this is the main mechanism. I'm only going to talk about two of these because we, we, we have limited time. And uh, so the... Uh, okay, well, I already said this. The, there are other voltage-gated ion channels that are activated. And there are a total of eight different ion channels that are activated. They all have a very similar structure called a voltage sensor that detects electrical changes across the plasma membrane. And so what I'm going to argue is the voltage sensor is the main direct target of these EMFs. Okay? And that because of the importance of calcium, most of the effects come from these, these, uh, these calcium channels. And... Uh, so, 
The industry acknowledges that microwaves and lower frequency EMFs put forces on positive or negatively charged groups, but states that the forces produced by these low intensity EMFs are too low to produce biological effects. And what I'm going to show you now is, is, is why this is not true, why the industry claims are not true. So um, this is a two-dimensional model of the VGCCs and the voltage sensor. And, uh, and so it, it's not accurate in all respects, and I'll tell you how it's not accurate, but it's something you can understand. That's why I'm using this, uh, this model. But what you see here, you see, so here's, there, there are four different domains. This is Roman numeral one, two, three, and four. And they each have a very similar structure. You can see that. Here's one, here's two, here's three, and here's four. And they each have uh, six of these cylinders. What are those cylinders? Those are alpha helices. Okay, so an alpha helix is a structure that occurs in proteins. And the fourth helix here is colored orange. It really doesn't have a color, but it's to tell you it's different, okay? And the way it's different is it has a whole bunch of positive charges on it. That's what these things are. Okay, all the, so you got five charges here, 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 and there. And those four orange helices together are the voltage sensor. They are the structure that detects electrical changes and responds to them by opening the channel, okay? And, um, and so, uh, so it turns out that these... These helices are not up and down. Uh, sorry, these, yeah, alpha helices are not up and down. They're actually tilted. So they're like this in the membrane. And they are within the lipid section of the membrane. And that turns out to be important for two different reasons, okay? One is that the forces on those charges is inversely proportional to the dielectric constant of the medium they're in. Uh, this is based on, on Coulomb's law, a law of physics that was first enunciated back in 1784, uh, five years before the French Revolution. And uh, there's another, another law of physics that also comes in here, and that's Ohm's law. And that is the, the, um, the plasma membrane of the cell has a very high electrical resistance, whereas the aqueous parts of the cell, the, where, the, where there's water and dissolved ions, have very high electrical conductivities. Because of that, the electrical gradient across the plasma membrane is highly amplified, about 3,000-fold. And that means the forces on those charges are amplified about 3,000-fold in addition. So when you look at these three factors, the fact that you've got 20 charges, the fact that um, Coulomb's law argues that the, uh, the dielectric constant means the forces on those charges are about 120 times stronger, and then Ohm's law suggests that uh, you've got about another 3,000-fold amplification, So, and you, you multiply these things together, and what do you get? the forces on the voltage sensor, comparing those forces with the forces on singly electrically charged groups, uh, the force on the voltage sensor is 20 times 120 times 3,000 times stronger, about 7.2 million times stronger than the forces on singly electrically charged groups in the aqueous parts of our cells and bodies. Now, as I said before, the industry claims these forces are inadequate to do anything. But when they're 7.2 million times stronger, which is what the physics is telling us here, they're, they're plenty strong to do things. And that's, that's a very, very important. OK, so, um, so what we have is a situation where the biology tells us that these voltage-gated calcium channels are the main target of these EMFs. And the physics is telling us why they're the main target. It's because the voltage sensor which controls them has incredibly strong forces on it, okay? And that's, um, so, okay. Now there's another, another study I, I, I want to mention to you. Uh, there was a, a study published by Takia et al. in 2016 in which they took isolated plasma membranes. 
So this is outside, no cells, just plasma membranes. And they measured the, um, the activation of these VGCCs, and they found that low intensities of three different microwave frequencies could directly activate those VGCCs. So that tells you it's a direct effect, again. And, uh, and so, so there's very strong evidence then. It's a direct effect. It's going through the voltage sensor, and we know why it, why it goes through the voltage sensor. And, and so, so what we have here is a situation where the biology and the physics are both pointing in the same direction. And, of course, what the safety guidelines do is they completely ignore all this stuff, which means the physics they're dealing with is not the right physics, okay? And uh, so that's important. Um, so how then do you get effects? And uh, I think you get effects mainly through, through this, uh, through two, two different things. So, so you get various kinds of frequencies. They activate the VGCCs. You get large increases in intracellular calcium. That's what this is. And one of the things that happen is you get, you get large increases in calcium signaling. And calcium signaling is very important in the body. And you get too much calcium in there, you get too much calcium signaling. That can cause pathophysiological, that is, damaging effects. Uh, you can also get increases in both nitric oxide and superoxide. Uh, and these can then re react with each other to form peroxynitrite, which is a potent oxidant. And uh, proxy nitrite levels have been shown to be elevated following EMF exposure. And by the way, they've been shown to be elevated in millimeter wave exposures as well as in some, you know, microwave and other, other frequencies. And, uh, and you get uh, proxy nitrite, it's a potent oxidant. It's not a free radical, but it can break down to form highly reactive free radicals. And, uh, and, 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 and these can all produce oxidative stress, and, uh, and they can also activate uh, this transcription factor, NF-kappa-B, which then produces uh, inflammatory responses. So you get inflammation. And uh, by the way, there, there is, there is a, uh, a literature that says NF-kappa-B activation has a role in carcinogenesis, so this is probably another another part of the cancer causation mechanism as well. Um, and so, so and, and the free radicals attack the DNA of the cells to produce the kinds of DNA effects that we discussed before. Okay. So, uh, so one of the things about this, I think, is that, you know, we talked about all these different effects, but they're linked together. I mean, these are not separate things. And so, for instance, uh, in, in, uh, in, in carcinogenesis, you can get, you know, you can get uh, the DNA effects, which cause cancer. Uh, they, in turn, are produced by the free radicals from this mechanism. And, uh, and, 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 and those things can then be active. Uh, one thing I wasn't planning to talk about, but I think I'm going to mention very briefly, and that is... This sequence of events leading to proxynitrite and free radicals um, is a very interesting one. And it's one where there are three steps in that pathway that can actually have high levels of amplification. And such that uh, when, you, when you activate the VGCCs, you get about a million calcium ions flowing in per second. So you can get a big amplification there. Um, you can then get uh, essentially a, a catalytic uh, increase in nitric oxide and also superoxide. So you know once the calcium levels are elevated, they can continue to stimulate nitric oxide and superoxide production as long as they're elevated. And then when these two react with each other to form proxy nitrite, the rate of the reaction is the product of the two concentrations. So you again get another level of amplification in that process. The consequence of that is quite interesting because it means that in some senses, under some conditions anyway, uh, a particular energy of non-ionizing radiation may even be more dangerous than the ionizing radiation. Because ionizing radiation um, basically, the energy that you have in it 
it never gets amplified. You can generate a certain number of free radicals from it, but there's really no, no further amplification on it. Here you can get quite large amounts of amplification. So in principle, in principle, and there is some evidence that this is true under some conditions, um, you can actually get worse effects from non-ionizing radiation than you can with ionizing radiation. Um, and uh, so while the industry claims that, you know, non-ionizing radiation is not dangerous, you don't have to worry about it, it's complete and utter nonsense. Now, I, I, I want to mention a, a, one other thing, and that is you can get therapeutic effects from these. And, uh, and the therapeutic effects are kind of interesting, in part because when you get therapeutic effects, it downregulates this peroxy nitrite pathway. And con con conversely, when you have peroxy nitrite pathway, it actually tends to shut down the therapeutic pathway. So um, you can get almost opposite effects from EMFs, depending on which of these two pathways under the conditions of being used is the predominant one. And that's, I think, quite interesting because, you know, when, when the industry says, oh, you know, for instance, you can get hypertension or hypotension, which is true, you can get both of those, but you get them under different conditions. And the industry says, oh, these are conflicting, but they're not. When you get them under different conditions, that doesn't, that's not, they're not, there's nothing conflicting about them. Um, you can, in fact, get op opposite or almost opposite effects under some conditions, and that's, something that's important to know. Okay, so um, all of this stuff, of course, is denied by the industry. Now, um, okay, so I, I've got in this table, which I'm not gonna talk about how these different effects get produced, but we've already talked about some of them, and uh, I'm basically just gonna screen through these because we really don't have time to talk about them. So, um, okay, now there, there are other effects which occur and um, which, uh, which I think are of, of concern where there's not quite the overwhelming evidence that we talked about before. But, you know, but uh, one of the concerns has to do with Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and let me just say, in our population now, we are seeing a decrease in the age of onset of Alzheimer's disease. And we are seeing... Uh, small numbers, but still significant numbers of people age 30 coming down with Alzheimer's disease. So one question, and I'm raising it as a question, I'm not saying that this is true, but I'll show you some evidence later that's important, uh, is uh, are the EMFs causing this very early onset Alzheimer's disease? Um, there are also uh, what have been called digital dementias, where people who use, uh, you know, and this is often young people who are using Wi-Fi or uh, other uh, digital uh, EMS for long time periods every day, and they develop these digital dementias. That's what's been called at uh, very young ages, and so that's that's obviously a big concern. And there, the causation seems to be pretty clear. So. Um, I, I, ADHD and autism is another thing which is, which is important. I'll talk about this later on because uh, I, think, I think this is an uh, important issue. And then there's EHS, which has been uh, discussed in, in some questions. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I may be able to deal with some of those later. Okay, so there are four reasons why EMFs are much more active in children than in adults. Uh, one of them is, is the one that's been most talked about, is that children have higher surface-to-volume ratios. In particular, their heads are much, their brains are much more exposed because, because they have thinner skulls and, they, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so, so their brains are more exposed. But um, children also have high densities of stem cells, which are particularly sensitive to the EMS. This has been discussed uh, by Dr. Igor, Igor Belyaev quite a bit in, in his research on this. Um, the developing brain appears to be especially sensitive to EMFs. I'll talk about that later. And uh, young tissues have much greater extracellular water content than do older, older tissues. 
And this leads to much deeper penetration of these effects. This has been discussed a lot by Dr. Deborah Davis. So, uh, you know, for all of these reasons, uh, Wi-Fi and uh, cell phone towers in schools are a special concern. And uh, this has been discussed. Um, this was discussed by the, in the, the Reykjavik appeal and also by a, a document that, uh, that was uh, uh, written by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And for whatever reason, all of these concerns with regard to uh, school irradiation have been widely ignored uh, in, in uh, many situations. So um, now let's go on to other flaws in the safety guidelines. So we've talked about three major flaws in the safety guidelines. It turns out there are a number of others that are important. And uh, so one of the ones that really hasn't been discussed before that I, I've started discussing are the role of nanosecond pulses. So again, we talked about the role of pulsations before, but there have been a lot of studies on these very short pulses. So a nanosecond pulse is defined as a pulse between one nanosecond and one microsecond. So there's actually quite a range in there, but they're all really short. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and what's important about these, um, among other things, is you, you, get, you have a lot of these nanosecond pulse studies where it's clear you're getting effects, but when you average these intensities over six minutes, the intensity is, is dropped so low that the safety guidelines claim they can't do anything. So you have a direct conflict between the actual findings and the structure of the safety guidelines. So again, this suggests that this whole notion of averaging exposures over six minutes makes absolutely no sense. And so, for instance, if you take a, a typical 40 nanosecond pulse and you get effects, and then you average it over six minutes, that's about 10 to the 10th times longer. So about 10 billion times longer. And of course, what happens then is, is you, you uh, decrease um, the average intensity by a factor of 10 billion, and then the and then the IGNOR guidelines say, oh, nothing can happen. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, now, uh, so, you know, averaging uh, a, 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 an event which we know uh, occurs over 10 billion times longer, to, you know, uh, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, this is completely nonsensical. And... Uh, and I, I want to. I, I, I've been trying to uh, think about a way in which the ridiculous nature of this can be communicated. And what I've come up with is the following: Let's say I'm afraid that I'm going to be shot by a high-powered rifle bullet going over 700 meters a second, and that rifle bullet takes about 50 microseconds to tear your body apart. Okay, so we we know that. Um, and you go to a regulatory agency and they say, oh, you don't have to worry about this. If we average it over 10 billion times longer, which turns out to be 75 days, um, the, uh, the force on your body is so low, you don't have to worry about it, right? And now, if, if you had a regulatory body that told you that, uh, what would you say? Well, you'd obviously say, well, they're either completely incompetent or completely corrupt or both, right? And exactly the same argument goes for the regulatory agencies that make this ridiculous conclusion that we should be, we should be averaging these things over six minutes. I mean, you know, so, um, yeah, that's, that's the world we live in, and, and it's, it's sheer lunacy. Okay, so, um, oh, um, so there's another kind of nanosecond pulse studies, which is also very interesting and very important. And that is there have been a whole studies of pairs of nanosecond pulses, where you have one nanosecond pulse and then you have another that occurs within a few microseconds of each other. And when you see that, uh, if the second pulse has the same polarity as the first pulse, you get super additive effects, okay? So you get much more than additive effects. If the second pulse has the opposite polarity, 
of the first pulse, uh, the second pulse cancels out most of the effect of the first pulse. So you actually get a much lower effect than you get with the first pulse alone. Okay, now neither of these are, are allowable uh, in, kinds of findings based on the safety guidelines. Everything's supposed to be additive in the safety guidelines, okay? Now, so, uh, and let me just say again, when you have a 5G system that is communicating via incredible numbers of nanosecond pulses, you're going to get a lot of these pairs of nanosecond pulses with the same polarity producing super additive effects. So uh, this is another reason why it's, it's eminently reasonable to think that 5G will be especially dangerous in terms of its properties. And uh, so, so, so let me just say, and I, I haven't told you this, but the, these nanosecond pulses also work by VGCC activation. The other pulses that I talked about before also seem to be acting in that way. And so one would expect that these, um, that these, um, these pairs are probably doing the same thing. And in fact, if you look at the, at the properties of the voltage sensor, these kinds of effects actually make some sense. And I'm not going to try to try to make that argument for you, but I think it's true. And so, um, uh, but there's another thing here that's important with regard to the safety guidelines, and that is when the uh, the, the ignor safety guidelines are based on averaging these things, these EMFs, as if they were scalars. What's a scalar? A scalar is something that has intensity but has no direction. But in fact, these are vectors, and they're vectors that have polarity, and both the fact that they're vectors and the fact that the polarity is obviously important here is, uh, is clearly a very important thing in terms of the way in which they act. The fact is that the ignorant safety guidelines have the physics wrong. They are dealing with these as if they were scalars, but they're not scalars. They're vectors with polarity. Okay? So, so, so again, the ignorant safety guidelines get the physics wrong. And that's their main argument is the physics, but they, they, they in fact don't get it right. Okay? So, um, There are three further fatal flaws um, in, the, in these safety guidelines. Uh, one is that, uh, and I think this was sort of referred to earlier, um, there are what have been called exposure windows. These are intensity windows where you have a, a, some range of intensities for a particular EMF where you get maximum effects. And when those intensities drop lower or higher, the effects drop way down. Okay, so you can have a you have an exposure window, and you increase the exposure out of the exposure window, and the effects drop way down. And there was one study that was published where you found where they found an exposure window, and they kept increasing the exposure up to 150 times where the window was, and it was still, the effects were much lower than you got with the exposure window. Now, what does that tell you? One thing it tells you is you've got very, very complex dose response curves, okay, which makes things very difficult to make predictions. And the second thing is, and, and so um, these, uh, those response curves are clearly both nonlinear and they're also non-monotone. Mon monotone means they don't always increase with increasing exposure. They don't always decrease with decreasing exposure. So um, what that tells you really is that it is extraordinarily difficult to set up any safety guidelines by any simple model, right? Because this is an extraordinarily complex system which shows extraordinarily complex dose response curves. And, uh, and so you can get effects 
as was stated before, where, where in, 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 in one of the questions, where you get very large effects at low intensities, very low intensities, and when you go up higher, you get much lower effects. Um, and, um, and this is, so this is something that's extremely important, and it, and it really says that the safety guide, and it's another thing, I mean, this, this is, the safety guidelines are, 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 are extraordinarily deeply flawed. Um, the other thing which is true is that the whole idea of adding things, of doing averages, are based on the assumption that you have linear dose response curves. If you don't have linear dose response curves, it makes no sense at whatsoever to average anything, you know, to average these exposures. So again, this, this says the structure of the safety guidelines makes absolutely no sense. Um, now, uh, what else do we have? Um, there are also a whole series of studies where individual research groups have used identical methodologies to examine different cell types. And what they find is they get very different effects from different kinds of cells. Okay, so some cells are much more sensitive to the EMFs than others. And as I, 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 uh, I think I had in my slide before, the stem cells seem to be particularly sensitive. Uh, but there are obviously other cells that are quite sensitive as well, and then, they, then you have all the many other cell types that are less sensitive. So um, what does that tell you? You, can't, you cannot ignore the biology here. In fact, all these things tell you you cannot ignore the biology. And yet that's exactly what the safety guidelines do. They completely ignore the biology. But when you look at this, it tells you. It simply cannot, you cannot ignore the biology uh, in the safety guidelines. If you do, they, they don't work. So, um, okay. Uh, now, the last thing, and this was already mentioned before, is there, there are also frequency windows. These are very specific frequencies which produce very large effects at very low intensities, extremely low intensities. Uh, orders of magnitude below, uh, uh, you, can get, you can get big effects, orders of magnitude below uh, the levels that are required by other frequencies to produce effects, nearby frequencies. This has been interpreted in terms of resonance effect, in terms of a resonance with a specific target. And I think that's almost certainly true. Um, what... Um, and, you know, so I predicted, well, these should be the voltage sensor, but in fact, we have no evidence whether that's true or not. The interesting thing is that the only case where we have evidence of what the target is, 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 is a study that was done by uh, Dr. Igor, uh, Igor Belyaev and his colleagues in the bacterium Escherichia coli. Now, Escherichia coli doesn't have BGCCs. Um, that doesn't mean... You know, but but the target in these studies, and they're very they're very good studies, was shown to be the DNA of the bacterium, and it was shown that the interaction of these uh, of these uh, frequencies was dependent on the supercoiling of the DNA, the structure of the DNA in the bacterium. Uh, so that's quite interesting, and it, it brings in the possibility that there's another important target. Now, I have to say, in, in animal cells and in plant cells, I haven't seen any evidence yet that the DNA of the cells um, may be an important target for producing the effects. And specifically, the DNA effects that we see come from the free radical attacks on it. They don't come from a direct interaction with, with the EMFs. So I don't know, that doesn't mean we, we won't find some, some effects later on, and that's, that's a possibility. Um, okay, so, so, so the whole thing is 5G entails extraordinary levels of pulsations, and, and you know, we're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to get very large effects because of the whole, the, the, the role of pulse, uh, the pulses, uh, the nanosecond pulses, the general thing of pulses, the paired nanosecond pulses, all of these things argue that, that 5G will be especially sensitive in terms, uh, especially active in pr producing these uh, uh, VGCC responses. And, uh, and so that's one thing, but there, 
Um, and, and then, uh, you know, we have these extraordinary numbers of 5G antennae that will be used in proximity to our homes, schools, hospitals, and businesses, uh, which will mean it's essentially impossible to avoid these high-level, extraordinarily pulsed exposures. Um, and uh, so, anyway, okay, I referred to this document that we gave the parliament. Um, so each of these findings strongly argue that 5G radiation will produce vastly greater health effects than do previously existing devices, which also produce a very large effects. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is talk to you about my, um, my five biggest concerns. And I'm not saying that these are necessarily the only things we should be concerned about. In fact, quite the contrary. And it may even be that there are some other things that are equal or perhaps even greater than these. But these are my, these are my sort of favorite nightmares on this thing, OK? Um, so one of the things I mentioned before uh, is this very early onset Alzheimer's and other dementias, OK? And, uh, and so the question is, does this have anything to do with, with uh, VGCC activation and, and excessive intracellular calcium? There is a, 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 a large amount of evidence that excessive intracellular calcium has essential roles in causing not only Alzheimer's disease, but each of the different neurodegenerative diseases, OK? So it is reasonable to think that BGCC activation could be producing it. It's also true that, that there are a number of studies which have shown that these EMFs um, uh, can uh, increase the levels of the amyloid beta protein, which is usually designated A beta, in the brain. And, uh, and these things, uh, and also in cells and culture, uh, including neuronal cells. So, uh, you know, A-beta has a key causal role acting as small protein aggregates uh, in, in, the, uh, in the process of causing Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there were two studies that were published uh, that showed in rats that you could generate an Alzheimer's-like response simply from giving a whole series of short pulses to young rats, and then you stop the exposures, and then you look in the equivalent of middle-aged rats, and what do you find? You find they have the usual uh, memory and behavioral problems that Alzheimer's has and produces in people. You also see that there are very high levels of the amyloid beta protein in the rat brains, and very high levels of oxidative stress in the rat brains. So this looks very much like Alzheimer's in rats. And the only thing you need to do to produce universal, very early onset Alzheimer's in rats is to give them a bunch of short EMF pulses as young rats. Think about that. Now, We've we've argued that you know that that 5G is probably going to be extraordinarily active, and therefore it is eminently reasonable that 5G. And, and let me just say, we know the millimeter waves can impact human brains and affect the EEGs from the the human brains. Okay, so they can get through the. Uh, you know, so in order to do that, they get through. They have to get through the hair, the, the hair, the skin, the skull, and the meninges to get at the underlying neural tissues and influence the EEG. So, so you know, so so you know, so you know, the industry claims that um, these millimeter waves only work in the outer millimeter or so in the body, and it's clearly that's not true. And and uh, and I've I've discussed what I think is the probable mechanism here for how you can actually get very deep effects from millimeter waves. Um, and there's also evidence from animal studies also that they behave much they they produce effects much more deeply than the industry claims is possible. So um, so we have that. And 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 so I think the point I want to raise here with regard to Alzheimer's. 
when you've got this incredibly active 5G radiation, if it acts the way these pulses did in animals, we could easily have universal or near universal early onset Alzheimer's disease simply from putting in 5G. Think about that. Um, okay, let's go on. Um, let's talk about autism. And uh, so let me say, first of all, uh, and I'm going to talk, what, what I think is the main pathway of action of autism is this one over here. Uh, it goes from low intensities uh, uh, radiation through VGCC activation, increases in intracellular calcium, impacting the formation of the synapses in the developing brain, okay? So in humans and in animals, the perinatal period, the period just before birth and after birth, is a period in which there is a tremendous amount of activity in which the neurons in the brain are making synaptic connection with other neurons. And those connections, although, you know, it's it, the, nothing in biology is 100% effective, I suppose. But, you, you know, if you, if you don't make the right connections, obviously the brain is not, is not going to work properly. And we know, in fact, from a number of studies that the synaptic connections in autism are aberrant. And one of the examples of that is that, is that there's evidence that the connectivity of the brains, and this has been shown uh, uh, both in humans and in, in animal models. The connectivity of different parts of the brain are different from what they are in, in normal individuals. And what's the connectivity is, is, you know, the way they connect is, of course, through the synaptic connections. Okay, so what do we know about the synaptic connections? We know that the synapse formation uh, involves five different mechanisms. There's the dendritic outgrowth of the neurons. There's a process for synapse formation. There is another process for synapse maturation and synapse elimination. So sometimes, occasionally, the wrong synapse is formed, and there is a process for getting rid of the improper synapses here, elimination. And then there's something else called MECP2 function, which which I'm not going to discuss, but is, is also known to be involved in, in the autism process, okay? Now, um, all five of these are regulated by intracellular calcium. So they can be disrupted by excessive intracellular calcium, by um, uh, inappropriate levels of calcium at particular times, and or even even by too low calcium levels, so it's obvious that you know you you can get and there is there is a, a large literature on, on on calcium roles in autism, uh, so that's not new in any sense. But uh, you know you can get so you can get disruption of these of these uh, synaptic things very simply. Now, I'm not saying that everything goes through the VGCC mechanism. There are also chemicals that act through this pathway to produce excessive calcium as well. My, uh, I, I believe that the main driver of the autism epidemic are, are the EMFs rather than the chemicals. And the reason I believe that is because many of these chemicals that act along this, this pathway had very, very large increases in their amounts in the 30 years following World War II. And that was really before the autism epidemic ever really got started, okay? So you have huge increases here, uh, and they, uh, you know, so I, I, that doesn't mean these chemicals don't have roles. They may well have roles, but if they do, it's probably synergistically with, with the EMFs. And, uh, and so we have that, okay? Now, another thing that happens in autism is you also have about 12 to 15 percent of the autism patients who have received de novo mutations, that is, mutations that were not found in either parent, okay? And so 
Um, and so what does that argue? It argues that, you know, even though this is not the predominant mechanism of autism, it's important. And I mean, we've had a 200-fold increase in autism over the last 45 years or so. Um, when you're finding 12 to 15 percent of these have these mutations, that's a significant number. And so um, what, uh, what I think is going on there is, is very simple. Intracellular calcium, and we already talked about this, produces these free radicals, then, then produces the cellular DNA damage, and those then can produce germline mutations. When you look at the, the kinds of germline mutations that are known to be involved in these de novo uh, mutations, they are the same kind of things that those three kinds of DNA can produce. They produce chromosomal rearrangements, they produce copy number mutations, and they produce point mutation. All three of those are involved in these de novo mutations that occur in autism. Okay, So um, the reason I'm mentioning this is in part because, uh, because and, and let me say, a lot of these germline mutations are things that either directly or indirectly uh, influence synaptic formation. Okay, so a lot of them are things that have direct roles in the synapses, but there are also other things that have indirect effects on, on synapse formation. So we can sort of make sense out of that. Um, the other thing, uh, but, you know, if you're getting a lot of mutations here, then what, hap what about all the other mutations that are going on? So this suggests that we have, in fact, a large increase in mutations. And we know that the EMFs, uh, produce these, uh, these cellular DNA damage in human sperm, including things that we're exposed to every day, Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation and so forth. So, um, uh, so this raises the question about what 5G is going to do. Is 5G going to have cause these mutations to go through the roof, in which case we may be just grossly contaminating our, 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 our gene pool? to the point where we'll just become extinct because of all of those effects. That's, that's, a, that's a real possibility when you have 5G that's extraordinarily highly pulsed. And, and uh, you know, the, the, these, these and, it, and it may already be the case that these, the, the mutation rates that we already have are very serious. But you put a, a huge increase on them. Um, that, will, that could easily produce curtains for the human race. Um, it's been estimated that a threefold increase in our mutation rate over a period of generations is sufficient to cause us to become extinct. Um, and these, these may already be much higher than that. So um, that's another thing. OK. Um, now, let's talk about the last, the last uh, three, two that I want to talk about. So um, I'm sorry. The, so the cellular DNA damage I already talked about. Let's talk about fertility. Now. Okay, so we already talked about what these what 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 are going on here. All these things are going on in, uh, in impacting our fertility, and uh, so how far along are these in human populations now? And what's been shown is there there was a a, a, a beautiful review published by Levine et al. in late 2017 with this title that showed that. Sperm counts in every single technologically advanced country on Earth that dropped to below 50% of normal. Think about that. Um, and, and uh, you know, that argues that there are, are the reproductive effects are already far along in our population based on the exposures we already have. Now, uh, you know, you can say, well, maybe something else is causing this. And that's possible. We just simply don't have any hypotheses that make any sense for this kind of massive effects that we see. And we know that EMFs can do this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, what, what I think we're seeing here, and, and I'll, 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 you know, finish up this way, but basically... You know, we are taking risks of the sort that no rational society on Earth can possibly take. Um, okay, so what, you know, you can say, well, okay, maybe we have 
And, and uh, but by the way, reproduction in these, all of these societies have dropped well below replacement levels. They were average, with one exception, they were averaging about 73% of replacement levels in 2016. Uh, that dropped at least modestly greater in 2017. And uh, we'll see what happens in 2018 when the data is available. Um, now, there, there, you know, you, you can say, well, maybe, maybe we got too many people. Maybe, you know, lowered reproduction might be okay, and, and it might be. But what happens if reproduction crashes to zero? That's the question I'm going to raise now. Uh, there was a study done by Magras and Zenos that was published uh, in uh, 21 years ago now, uh, where they took young pairs of mice. Uh, they put them in little cages on the ground in an antenna park. So the, the, the levels on the ground were well within our safety guidelines, so nothing should happen, right? Of course. And yet what happened was at one level that was somewhat higher level exposure, they got an immediate effect in the first litter. So a litter in mice takes 30 days. They're really quick. Um, uh, so you get lowered reproduction in the first litter, lowered reproduction in the second litter, and then reproduction crashed to zero. What does that tell you? It tells you, first of all, these effects are cumulative, okay? And by, by the time you got to 90 days, you know, that was enough to have cumulative effects. You see changes in the structure of the testis. In, in mice in, in, uh, with, with those kinds of time periods. And uh, so, so you're, getting, you're getting effects that can at least explain this. Uh, at the lower level exposure, it, took, it was the fifth letter that crashed to zero. As best you can determine, when you take these out of the EMFs, you see almost no recovery. You see maybe a tiny, tiny bit of, of reproduction, but it's, it's almost no fertility at all. Um, so these appear to be apparently irreversible. And, uh, and so, um, and, and again, uh, we're in a situation where we're already pretty far along in this stuff. Are we starting to see any examples of crashes in reproduction in human populations? That's the question. And I think for the first time, I think we are now starting to see these. These are all, all three of these examples are in densely populated, high technology, East Asian countries. Um, so these are certainly among the countries that have, you know, have the, the highest exposures. Um, that doesn't mean we can take much, uh, you know, of course, if we put in 5G, we might be far, far above their exposure levels instantaneously. Singapore had a 31% drop in reproduction between 2016 and 2017. Now, these are relatively good times. You know, usually you see large decreases in reproduction if there's a war, if there's a famine, uh, if there's a huge economic collapse, and none of those things are going on here, uh, and yet you see a huge drop. Macau, which isn't really a separate country but has separate statistics, had a 26% drop in reproduction between 2016 and 2017. South Korea had an 11% drop in reproduction between 2016 and 2017, and another 9% drop in approximately in the first half of 2018. Okay, so we are seeing very, very large drops that are unexplained, and in, in each of these have, have very high exposures. Um, I don't know, and let me just say, South Korea, I think, currently has the highest autism rate that's ever been measured. So South Korea, among the larger countries, is probably... Um, you know, one country that may be, may be very, very highly exposed. Again, um, I, so, I, you know, I think it's reasonable to think that you put in 5G radiation and we may go over the re reproductive cliff in a much shorter time, you know, in months, uh, with, with the, all of this, ex, you know, huge, huge levels. Um, but even without that, I think it's highly probable we're, we're going to be looking at drops 
in, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in, in Europe, in North America, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, other, other, you know, and other, and probably Japan might be particularly susceptible to this, because they're, um, and uh, by the way, Taiwan also, uh, Taiwan may be approaching these, this, uh, these um, uh, uh, reproductive crash. It's, it's not quite as clear, but there is some evidence that Taiwan may be looking at another reproductive crash. So, um, and, and, and so those three countries already had among the lowest reproductive rates in the world, le below 60% of replacement levels. What that means is one year drop puts them well down into the 40s, okay? And you get another drop like that, you know, they're, they're, they, they will be, if, if it occurs, uh, it will be, they, they will be going, you know, this is, this is what we're looking at, I think. Um, so, again, I can't, I can't prove that all of this is caused by EMFs, but what I can say is we simply don't have another hypothesis that makes any sense, and we know the EMFs can cause these kinds of issues uh, in animals and, 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 uh, and in humans. Uh, so, you know, that's, um, yeah, so, okay. Now, the last thing I want to talk about are the neurological neuropsychiatric effects. So, these include insomnia, fatigue, depression, headache, lack of concentration, cognitive dysfunction, anxiety, stress, agita stress and agitation, memory dysfunction. Uh, there are also, uh, oh, headache, I forgot to read that. Headaches are very common. Uh, and, uh, you know, so these are things that have become more and more common in our societies. They become, uh, you know, I extremely common. We know they are caused by multiple types of EMF exposures. And uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in animals, uh, what you see is accumulative effects on the structure of the brain, where uh, initially, uh, again, with uh, levels well well below our safety guidelines, uh, initially you see you know relatively modest effects, and uh, if you then take the animals out of these EMFs, uh, the structure of the brain actually recovers pretty much to normal. If you continue these, then you get uh, uh, massive impacts on the brains of the animals, and that, that is then apparently irreversible. You take the animals out, and you see almost no, no changes from this highly aberrant structure. So, you know, one of the things that that should tell you, and by the way, there are also occupational exposure studies that were done back in the 1970s and 1980s, which suggests that a similar pattern occurs in humans in terms of these kinds of effects. Uh, that is basically, you know, you, you look, for instance, in some of these occupational exposure studies, a uh, period of a year, year and a half, two years, and you get a relatively modest effects, but you keep going, and by the time you're looking at six years, you've got massive effects. And, uh, and so the cumulative nature seems clear. Um, it's not quite as clear about the reversibility, because I don't know that there's anything that's been studied on that, but there, is, there, there are some indications that um, there was a review published by Carl Hecht who, who argued that, that the, uh, <coughs> in these occupational exposures, if you take, take people out of the EMFs and put them in an, a, a no EMF environment, and we had no EMF environments then, or essentially no EMF environments, which we don't have now, and you, and you got uh, um, you know, good recoveries over a period of a couple of years. Um, on the other hand, uh, when, when they become more severe, then, then you, you don't see those kinds of improvements. So the consequences of this is that when you have the kind of propaganda claims that ignorant makes, that the, the um, 
US FCC makes, uh, et cetera, that Center makes, and so forth, that none of these things are true and none of them are, are established. The inevitable consequence is that you get hundreds of millions of people who become severely and irreversibly damaged. That is the inevitable effect from this. And if you go ahead with 5G, we may get these things instead of in years, we may get these in months. Um, I don't know how fast it's going to be, but I'm greatly concerned about this. So, um, okay. Uh, you know, so, uh, oh, I was going to say, yeah. So, you know, so we're, we're talking here about the human effects, but I, and, you know, what's true is that millimeter waves, uh, produce impacts in tissues deep in the body. And I, I talked about the, the example of the EEG effects, but there are also animal effects which showed that they were, that they were uh, effects deeply in the body. So that, um, um, now on the other hand, the surface effects of millimeter waves are very heavy. These are intense effects near the surface. And consequently, they will have uh, much more severe effects in organisms that have high surface-to-volume ratio, inevitably. And most organisms do have higher surface-to-volume ratios than we do, because we've got relatively large bodies. And, uh, uh, and interestingly, uh, you know, so I expect that many uh, insects, small mammals and birds, and, and many plants and I say many plants because even large trees have their leaves and reproductive organs highly exposed. So um, that they will be severely affected and that we will have ecological disasters, uh, vast ecological disasters. And interestingly, there was um, uh, a couple of patents that were issued in the U.S. I've got the patent numbers here, which argued that millimeter waves should be used as insecticides. Simple way of killing off insects. And the higher the frequency, the more insect killing you get. So, um, you know, so I expect that there will be, you know, there will be crashes, huge crashes. And we're already seeing crashes in, re in insect population. So uh, this will make it vastly worse. And, uh, um, and, and let me tell you, one of the other kind of ecological thing that was reported in the Netherlands is they were doing 5G tests and large numbers of bird fatalities occurred from apparent sudden cardiac death. Um, let me just say the first, the first articles that came out on this, uh, the industry was de denying that they were doing the tests and the regulatory agency was also denying they were doing the tests. But it turned out later that uh, another reporter came out and interviewed a lot of the workers. And the workers were told to lie about this, and a number of them did not lie about it. And they said, yeah, we were going out and doing these tests of 5G. And uh, so it appears that you know the industry was trying to cover this up. And interesting, the regulatory agency was trying to cover this stuff up. So uh, you can't trust anybody. Um, there are um, other studies that have shown that millimeter waves can cause sudden cardiac death in small uh, mammals. This was done in mammals, not in birds. Um, so, um, but those studies took longer before you got these effects. Whereas the bird effects, they were just flying there and they crashed. They were essentially instantaneously killed. Um, so, uh, you know, we have, uh, and by the way, there was also a study reported in, in California where a flock of birds was, was flying through a microwave relay signal and where similar things happened with the birds. They, they apparently just, you know, their hearts just stopped and they crashed. Um, so... You know, th these, these, you know, these reports are very difficult to document in, in, in complete convincing situation, but I think this is the kind of thing where it's not at all surprising 
that uh, you know 5G might have these kinds of effects um, because of the known cardiac effects of the EMFs. And uh, so, um, okay. There's another thing that I've been arguing, and that is that 5G may be responsible for producing massive fires because EMFs have impacts on plants that cause them to produce very high levels of highly volatile, highly flammable terpenes so that they, be, they can become highly, you know, very flammable. Um, we may have seen the first examples of 5G fires. I say may because, you know, this is always can be questioned. But there were five smaller cities along the east coast of South Korea where just within the last uh, three weeks or so, there were uh, some massive fires that, that came. These were among the earliest places in the world for 5G rollouts, okay? So this may have been what's going on here. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, again, this isn't proof, but it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a red flag that we need to be concerned about. And uh, so in, in summary, you know, I encourage skepticism about everything I have to say. Healthy skepticism is essential for all good science. Um, but what I think is clear is the entire structure of these safety guidelines has been shown to be completely false. It's been falsified. Um, we have effects um, based on uh, on on uh, you know some some of the uh, exposure windows based on the sensitivity of the voltage sensor, um, where you know where things appear to be off by something like seven orders of magnitude from where they should be. Um, we have incredibly complex dose response curves. We have incredibly complex issues with biological heterogeneity and the way in which things things work in different tissues. Um, and uh, so when you look at these these and 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 then there's the whole issue of pulsation, which is extremely important. So you know these each of the eight different findings that, that I discussed before show that the the biology cannot be ignored. Um, the the uh, most you know the, the, most of these things show that the whole whole notion of averaging over six minutes is completely nonsensical, and uh, and that the allowable levels are clearly are clearly highly inappropriate. So um, anyway, we've talked five probable, at least I believe they're probable imminent existential threats to our survival from 5G. And in each case, we have highly plausible mechanisms uh, by which you can produce these effects. And uh, it, it just, you know, it, it, it's, you know, no rational society on Earth can possibly do this. None. It makes absolutely no sense to do this. So I hope that, um, you know, you can, you know, I, I guess, you know, I've said to a number of you people, my goal is to save one country. Maybe if we save one country, we can start saving other countries. So if, um, if this country uh, can be number one, I'd be delighted. And uh, so I hope that... Uh, um, you know, that uh, maybe you can put pressure on your legislators to start doing something that makes sense. Because right now, nothing that's going on anywhere in the world makes any sense. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, now time for questions. Uh, question is, um, is there somewhere out there some kind of research or science that shows that radiation is good for health? Well, yeah, the, the, the therapeutic effects that I discussed. But you have to have, you know, the right level focused on the right part of the body 
and uh, you can get the therapeutic effects. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that, is, that is useful and that's important. You know, what's, what's interesting is that the industry is so tied to the notion that nothing is going on. They simply deny all the therapeutic effects along with denying all the, all the pathophysiological effects. So, so you know, uh, yeah, we live in a strange world, but yes, the, the answer is yes, yeah. Uh, to continue with the therapeutic radiation, uh, mm -hmm. is there some kind of uh, possibility uh, that we can actually put it to good use and then to enhance body with uh, therapeutic radiation? Yeah, it is going on now. We use uh, EMFs to stimulate bone growth in situations where bones are not healing properly. That is used now, and and so it is, uh, you know, is being used. And uh, so, um, you know, that's the one that's been most documented is the stimulation of bone growth. Okay, so. Um, um uh, yeah. The question was about uh, 5G, that if there is something to counter the 5G radiation so that we can use some kind of other radiation to heal the effects of 5G. Um, well, I, <laughs> I wish I could tell you that. There, I mean, I, I do think there are some things that we can do that help improve our body's response. To, to, to the radiation, but when you have something so massive as the, what's expected with 5G, um, I, I, you know, I, I really don't hold out much hope for this. Um, you know, so, um, in fact, the, the, you know, it is the case that the regulatory system that I, maybe I can go back to that slide, um, let me see if we can go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, this, uh, this regulatory system uh, that's triggered by nitric oxide signaling is uh, it's called NERF-2. And there are actually a lot of other things that raise NERF-2 that have health-promoting effects. So you don't have to use radiation to get that. There are other ways of doing it, um, and uh, but uh, but it does you know lower this pathway, and that can be that can be useful. Um, so, but uh, you know the the problem with five G is the, the expectation is this is going to be an absolutely massive thing, and we're already seeing huge huge effects from the, all the EMFs that we're already exposed to. So yeah, no. the question is. Um, mm, is there some kind of um, uh, live uh, demonstration that can quickly demonstrate uh, uh, terrible effects of the 5G radiation, which is like you sort of just look at it and then everybody can understand, oh, that's terrible, like house burns down? I, I, I think the demonstration that can be done, uh, there is a quick demonstration that can be done, but whether it's going to in influence everyone to think it's horrible is another question. Um, you can, and this has been done actually in plants, uh, you can measure intracellular calcium levels uh, in two different ways. One is you can use transgenic uh, organisms that carry... Um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, green fluorescent protein, which is a protein that binds calcium and changes its fluorescence. You can also use uh, dyes that will be taken up into the cells that can measure calcium levels. So there are ways of, of doing this, and that then tells you that there is an effect. And in fact, I think that's probably the best way of doing uh, biological safety testing because you can do those, but that you know, uh, you know, if you want, if you want the, you know, it depends on what you want to, you know, what, whether that's convincing in terms of the time frame is going to be is is quite rapid because because these uh, you you can get calcium levels increasing, you know, within seconds. Uh, so yeah, it's quite rapid. Instant effect, basically. 
it, it, it can be an instant effect. I mean, you know, um, it turns out it turns out in plants actually it, it takes a little bit longer because plants have a a better way of sequestering the calcium away from out of the cytoplasm uh, than we do. So 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 they they they're quite active in doing that, and it's only when that system starts to get saturated that that you see the effects. But yeah, when when in our cells it can be it can be instantaneous. In fact. Uh, uh, there was a paper shown that uh, where where the um, where this this um, nitric oxide signaling pathway was shown to be triggered by um, by uh, uh, EMFs uh, within less than five seconds. You got this uh, big effect. On nitric oxide levels, um, and that that's uh, you know that's quite rapid. And you, you, so that's another thing you can do. You can use a nitric oxide uh, electrode to measure nitric oxide levels. That's another thing you can do to look at, at rapid effects. So, uh, I have a question about uh, the same slide. Okay. Um, so there are a few ways how you can uh, boost your nitric oxide levels. You know, either artificially taking Viagra or whatever or using uh, low-level uh, light therapy like photobiomodulation or mm -hmm. uh, just doing those crazy exercises. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that if you push your nitric oxide levels too high artificially or maybe, you know, mm -hmm. in beats or whatever, mm -hmm. but you don't, care, uh, you don't take care of the um, EMFs and uh, the EMFs are still like very, very high in your environment, mm -hmm. does, this, does this mean that you actually might be doing a disservice for your body, or is it? Well, it, 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 it's it's complicated because okay, so so it is the case that when you stimulate this pathway, it downregulates this entire pathway, so that's good. Um, however, nitric oxide does other things, and one of the things nitric oxide does is it binds to cytochromes and inhibits their activity. Okay, so nitric oxide, and then of course the other thing it can do is to react with superoxide to form proxy nitrite. Um, the so so you know it, it, it's a it's a little bit of a difficult uh, thing, and and let me just say, Viagra doesn't actually increase nitric oxide. The direct effect of Viagra is to um, is to uh, raise the level of, of cyclic GMP because the breakdown of cyclic GMP is inhibited. So it actually acts at this stage in the pathway rather than at that stage of the pathway. Um, so it, it inhibits a phosphodiesterase that breaks down cyclic juice, that breaks down this compound that's involved in the nitric oxide signaling pathway. I don't know if that's... I. So uh, anyway, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, got so, another one. Okay. Uh, what about um, trying to increase your um, um, like natural EMFs? Like uh, there's a uh, this um, magnetic magnetic co sleeping pad that uh, uh, gives like this polarized magnetic field, but where people try to sleep on and then they feel that you know they feel better. Uh, EMF wise, do you think that this would be a good strategy? Okay, I didn't get the the first part of your question. Sorry. Like, uh, if you want, if you would uh, amplify your natural um, Earth's magnet magnetic field. Okay. Trying to okay. combat the EMFs. Okay. Um, uh, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, there is some evidence that the EMFs that are close to the Schumann resonance, the 7.8 hertz, actually lowers the sensitivity of the VGCCs. So I've been saying they all work the same way, but there's one that there's, there's some in that range that actually have an opposite effect. And that's, um, so it's possible that you could get an, a, a, a favorable effect in that way. Uh, it might just lower the the sensitivity of the of the voltage sensor 
to these other effects. Um, you know, the, the problem is you really need to do a lot of quantitative studies on these things, and those have not been done. And that's something, you know, there's, a, there's um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, you know, I keep telling people, well, we know a lot about these things, and I think we do, but there, there are also a number of areas where we really would like to have a lot more information, and this is one of them. So the question is, um, um, are our doctors uh, able to identify um, these uh, um, health effects uh, from bad radiation? Well, only if they know about them. That's, of course, the problem. Most of them don't know about any of these things. I mean, you know, we have... I mean, I mean, I guess the answer in principle is yes, but in practice is a different question. You know, what we really need, I think, is we need some measurements to be taken before and after 5G is turned on. In order to know that, we need to know when the 5G is turned on. We need to have people who are willing to be tested. I mean, there are a number of these things that can be tested by standard clinical tests. You know, you can measure oxidative stress responses, for instance. You can measure nitric oxide. Um, so so there, are, there are ways of, of, of doing these things with standard clinical tests. But... Um, you know, if nobody's collecting the data, then it doesn't help us any. Um, you know, I, I've been trying to encourage um, public organizations that seem to be perfectly willing to allow us to be exposed to actually do some measurements to find out what, what's going on in our bodies. But no, no, so far I haven't been able to find anybody that I can persuade to do that. If you have any information on... Uh how much uh, awareness is there in the United States about what's really going on with radiation and the effects of uh, EMFs through media? Um, almost none. It's starting to change now, but um, so I guess I have some hopes that maybe people will become more aware. But I mean, you know. And, I mean, there was an article that was published in the New York Times by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter that when you look at that article, it was just straight industry propaganda. That was done about, uh, what, four, four weeks ago, I think, something like that. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the media are just, uh, it's just extraordinary what's, what's going on. And it doesn't, you know, I, I, we are seeing some improvements, but, you know, we're also seeing some, some things that are going backwards, if anything. Um, so I, I do have some hope that things are moving in the right direction, but uh, at this point it's so slow that it's, it may not make any difference. Let me just say something more about, about the situation in the U.S. Um, you know, we take great pride in our science in the U.S. We have far more Nobel laureates than any other country. And we think, oh, we're the top dogs in science. But in this area, we're nowhere. And the reason we're nowhere is because all the public funding got cut off between 1986 and 1999. And since then, there's been almost nothing done in the U.S. other than what the industry is funding. And so the consequences of that is that we've had uh, somewhere uh, around 350,000 uh, 350, cell phone towers put up, many of them with, you know, strong government support, and there has not been done, there has not been one study done in the U.S. on the health effects of living near cell phone towers. There have been studies, there have been 17 studies that have been published on this. They're all, they've all been done elsewhere. Um, 
we have Wi-Fi all over the place. There have been 23 studies published on genuine Wi-Fi radiation. Not a single one of them has been done in the U.S. Um, and it's almost as bad with the, with the cell phones, except that we had the NTP study. So, you know, it's just, um, I, you know, I, 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 I hate to say this, but by this criterion, um, and there are other criteria that you might want to use, but by this criterion, uh, the U.S. science uh, is, is the most corrupted science in the world. And, um, you know, I, I say this with, with incredible personal regret. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, and there were a lot of people in the U.S. who had funding back when there was funding, and then the funding got off, and a number of these people are now uh, 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 testifying for the industry on these things. So, anyway, that's the world we live in. Uh, just wanted to ask, how large is the um, uh, community from your um, educational level in other countries that you have support with, and you can, you know, share ad idea ideas with, and you know develop this further? Well, I, I uh, you know, I've been getting, I've been giving many, you know, large numbers of talks in uh, professional meetings, and, uh, and right now I am scheduled to give, uh, I think, a dozen professional talks um, between now and the end of November. Four of those are um, keynote addresses at major meetings. So, you know, and, and so, so, so there is a lot of interest in this. The first paper that I published on the VGCC mechanism has been cited uh, 227 times, 221 under the main heading, and then some others under other headings. Um, so, so there's been a lot of interest in this. And, you know, and it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of it's coming from other countries. Um, but, um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I um, the problem is that we've got this gigantic um, industry that seems to be willing to do anything it can to put this stuff out. And it, it really is, uh, it's just stunning the corruption that has occurred as a consequence of all of this. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to follow the example in Danish school where uh, kids uh, had uh, two uh, plants, uh, one exposed to Wi-Fi yeah. and the other not, and so maybe we should do something like that everywhere. Yeah, I think, they, I think what they showed was that the seed gen, gen, uh, germination was impacted. I think, that, isn't that what they showed? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I um, no, I think there's a lot that can be done. And I think that, uh, you know, th there are um, uh, plants, and I, I'm thinking of Arabidopsis plants, uh, where, where you've got, um, you've got a marker in there to look at calcium levels, you know, where people have done that. And you, you, can, you, can, you could just look at calcium levels in the plants. Um, so uh, it's not difficult to do some of these things. Um, the, so, um, yeah, there's a lot that could be done. I mean, I, 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 think, um, I, I, I think, you know, that that's... that's uh, that's a useful way of doing things, yeah. In, in light of this, it's uh, very difficult for telecom companies to be honest and transparent. So um, when we see all the advertisements about uh, fast download speeds, very convenient, you know, everything, everything is super swell then. So the proposal is to maybe help uh, telecom companies to stay honest in their business and actually include in the advertisement that you also get like a brain tumors and your house burn downs and all the other nice things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so there's a comment that in Israel, supposedly 
the whole territory is uh, uh, blocked. 5G is blocked or not allowed? Or no, I don't think so. Not true? No, I don't think so. I, I, in fact, I was just interviewed by an Israeli. Um, no, I don't think that's true. Yeah. Well, and the, the Israel Telecom was, was, uh, was bribing uh, Netanyahu. So, <laughs> yeah. So, why, um, yeah. So, uh, there was a comment that there exists a device, that there exists a device which is able to uh, run diagnostics on body and within five minutes give uh, feedback uh, uh, of the effects of EMF on the body. Um, as a Last commentary, I'd like to uh, say great thanks to this um, uh, comprehensive and extremely compelling lecture you've given us. Um, almost halfway through, I already got extremely angry. <laughs> I yeah. think we all should get angry, because mm -hmm. that is like a catalyst to start making changes. I, I certainly hope so. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. just uh, keep up the good work, and uh, I really hope that this message gets uh, widespread. Thank you. Um, maybe I also came here to learn myself. I can ask a question. Uh, it's about uh, VGC C valve. As I understood, it's uh, there's a voltage sensor on the cell, mm -hmm. and if there's an electrical signal then basically the cell lets calcium into the cell, correct? Yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. uh, could it be that the cell is protecting itself from EMF when letting in the calcium, sort of like a blocker? No, because if, if it were, then you wouldn't see good effects by using a calcium channel blocker. You'd see bad effects by using a calcium channel blocker. So, but why is body then using calcium? And if not, is there anything else that also is let into the cell? Yeah, there are. The, the other, okay, so the other uh, voltage gated ion channels are also activated. There's a sodium channel, which um, allows sodium to come into the cell. And there's a potassium channel, basically lets potassium leak out of the cell. And then there's a chloride channel as well. So those are activated, but the, all, the evidence that we have is that they have relatively minor effects. And that, um, and that it, it may well be the case that the sodium channel by, so that when the sodium channel is activated, it, it depolarizes the plasma membrane, and that, that in turn can activate the calcium channels. So, you know, it may ha act indirectly to, to activate the calcium channels. So basically the calcium channel, it's basically a bog, which EMF triggers. It's not a feature. It's, uh, I'm it's sorry. a bog. It's a bog, like a malfunction that EMF is triggering. Uh, it's not a, like a good design method. It's well, I mean, you know, the, the, the VGCCs have in fu functions in the body. They do work to, you know, to uh, produce uh, short-term uh, calcium increases in calcium signaling. But the problem is that when you, you have this grossly excessive activity, then it's a different situation. So that's a problem. I, and let me just say, uh, it's my opinion that, and, and this is based not on, on studies of these, but on one other situation where you see uh, therapeutic effects from uh, a modest increase in the VGCC activity that you're looking at a, a relatively modest increase there. You're not looking at a very large increase uh, in with with the uh, with the, in the therapeutic effects. This is a question is from the point of electrosensitive person. Uh, I have studied a little medicine and I remember that. Um, for heart disease, there are such medicines that are called uh, calcium channel blockers. Do I uh, am mm -hmm. correct? And yeah. do you think these medicines which are used uh, for heart disease, they can be helpful for uh, hypersensitive people? Do you know anything about it? I know something about it. You know, when, when this... 
work first came out, there were some physicians that tried this and claimed that it didn't seem to work. However, recently I've heard that low levels of the calcium channel blockers may help people with, uh, with EHS. Um, and so that's something that you, you know, maybe should be tried. But you, you have to get a physician who's willing to, to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to write a prescription for it. That's, that's, that's a problem. There is, there is another, another compound actually, which I, where there is some, there, there are actually some other compounds that, that, also work on the on the VGCCs um, that may also be helpful. Uh, one of them is a, a compound called chromalin, C R O M Y no, chromo C R O uh, M O L Y N, uh, which is which is a drug. Uh, that lowers the activity of the mast cells, okay? And the mast cells get activated through the VGCCs. So um, um, anyway, that's a drug that's been used, and that might be useful. Um, it's used in the U.S. mostly as a nasal spray, um, but you can get oral chromalin, for mastocytosis. I'm told that in Italy, for some reason, you can buy chromalin off the, uh, over the counter uh, for, uh, you know, as, a, as an oral. So, I don't know. Something like that might be useful, but... Uh, chromalin? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me, let me just say, I'm a PhD, not an MD. Nothing I say should be viewed as medical advice. I, mean, I just, I, 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 you know, I, I have to say that in this situation. So, okay, yeah. Uh, are the calcium channels also influenced by magnetic storms from the sun? I think they must be because the magnetic storms produce similar effects. And there, there is a substantial literature on that. Uh, what's interesting about the the um, I, 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 there, there's another phenomenon that's been discussed, and and I, I sort of referred to it in here, and it's the issue of pol polarization and the polarity. Um, the these these artificial EMFs are polarized because of the way they're generated. And whereas most natural EMFs are not polarized. However, I believe that the, uh, the uh, solar storm radiation may well be polarized. There's at least some indication in the literature on that. I don't know that it's definitive. So, um, and, and, and so the polarized EMFs appear to be much more, uh, m much more active in putting forces on these electrically charged groups. And so it's thought that that's an important part of this mechanism. And uh, so I don't know, maybe, uh, Leonard, you probably know more about geomagnetic storms than I do, huh? No? <laughs> but you live up there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm. I'm trying to look uh, all of this from the point of view that let's say this is all is inevitable and the 5G is going to be more rolled out and uh, one of my earlier questions was um, if there could be any ways to enhance our immune system now I would just further develop this question yeah um, so could there be any capabilities in nanotechnology and uh, combination with biology to like in the future maybe uh, to build some nanomachines uh, that would be able to either alter the um, genetic uh, systems or maybe fix the cellular level, something like that. Could you believe any of, of that potential? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I don't, I, it's, it, it's not obvious to me, let's put it that way. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, the, um, 
you know, I mean, there there are things that you can do to, you know, put shielding in your walls and over your windows and things of that sort to protect yourself in your house. So the problem is you don't want to just be holed up in your house and not be able to go outside. I mean, so this is, you know, this is sort of, you know, I mean, we're in a lunatic situation. Uh, you can wear shielding that uh, may help protect yourself outside too, but, uh, you know, the shielding you put over your head is going to make you look like a freak. So I heard that you're going to go and meet our leaders as well, political leaders. Tomorrow. So what will be your message to them? Well, the problem is that we have very, very short time period to, to talk. I don't know. We have very, very limited time. I mean, that's the problem. And I, I, uh, I will do what I can. I, I, you know, I, 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 I yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating when you think that you're in a situation where things are so dire and you simply don't have the ability to communicate this to the people who can actually do something. Maybe we can communicate enough information that at least will raise some red flags and then if some of you people start writing lots of letters and get other people to write letters to your uh, members of parliament, maybe we can actually get something. I don't know. I have a question. Um... Earlier you said that uh, all you need is just, you know, begin with one country, to say one country. If I may ask, how many have you been through before doing this similar thing, giving talks? Well, I haven't really done what I'm doing here. Um, I've been working with other countries, but in different ways. Uh, like, for instance, in Australia, um, the Australian organization or PANZA, which is the organization that's supposed to be regulating the EMFs, wrote a four-page letter to some people who were very concerned about 5G, telling them the usual um, crap about, you know, from about what the industry's been claiming, but providing either no evidence or no adequate evidence on anything, and it turned out that every single statement they made was false. So I wrote a, a rebuttal on it and sent it off to Australia. And then I've, I've written some other things for them. So I don't know. There may be a big enough group there that maybe they can use this as a way of actually getting something. I, I just don't know what the best way is to do this. I just, you know, but... but you know, when, you know, what's, uh, what was unusual was that Arpanza actually wrote something where they made specific claims that were very easy to rebut. Not just one, but a whole bunch of them. And so I thought, well, if you've got that, you know, you, you, you can attack these guys and you can provide the evidence that shows that this is all crap, which is what I did. What's interesting is that the people who, who are in, in this organization, uh, at, at least one of them is, is at least has some competence as a scientist. And, and interestingly, he published a paper on um, ipsilateral effects of, of, uh, of cell phone radiation, showing that the cell phones were affecting the one side of the head where people use their cell phones and not the other side, or at least much less on the other side of the head. And so he knew that there was this evidence out there, and yet the Arpanza document just ignores all this stuff. So I went and wrote a, wrote a thing about saying, okay, here, here's the various studies that have been done on ipsilateral versus contralateral sides, you know, and, and it clearly shows that there's an effect from cell phones. I mean, I don't, I don't see there's any doubt about that. Um, so anyway, but you know, it's we we live in a corrupt world. We really do. It is, it, the corruption here is just stunning. Well, I mean, every every autism child has a massive impact on a family. Every one. I mean, you just have. Um, let me, let me just say a little bit about this. Um, you know, this this perinatal effects, um, because. You know, I, I mean, I talked about autism. I didn't talk about ADHD, although ADHD 
In fact, the animal studies on ADHD are actually uh, much more convincing. You, there are a whole series of, there are at least, yeah, there are four different studies that have been published on prenatal exposures in animals producing ADHD-like effects, which, which, which um, impact the animals all the way through adulthood. So you, have a, you basically have permanent changes, or at least semi-permanent changes, in the brain that occur from prenatal exposures that affect the behavior throughout the life of these animals that are very similar to ADHD. Now, so I think ADHD is basically like autism, except it's, it's a much milder thing. Um, this, uh, these effects, however, um, may well go far beyond both ADHD and autism. And um, Dr. Boyd Haley has suggested that because, um, you know, I, I mean, both ADHD and autism are much more common in males than in females. And, 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 and the evidence is that uh, the, the testosterone levels uh, in utero are, are a key factor here in terms of what, uh, you know, producing these more severe effects in, 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 in male babies than in females. Um, and there are other kinds of factors that also, where, where the males seem to be more sensitive to these effects, including the genetic effects that I talked about before. The same gene that produces a pretty severe effect in male children produces a much more modest effect in female children. Exactly the same kind of mutation. So um, the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is that, is that what Haley has suggested is that the selective effects on males versus females in, in, in utero may go to other kinds of effects, neurological effects, that, and, and we have very high levels of male dysfunction in our societies uh, where, where males used to be able to do all kinds of things, either are impaired in doing them or also, in some cases, you know, not motivated to do them. And uh, so I think that... Um, a lot of the male dysfunction is, is probably caused by this same mechanism. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the prenatal period. And uh, if that's true, then, you know, the, the, the male dysfunction that we're seeing now in, you know, people age 20, 25, whatever, um, May will an, almost certainly be a tiny, tiny fraction of what we will see, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now because of the much higher levels of exposure and the much higher levels of autism that are, are occurring. So, you know, you look at those in, you know, in, in, in late teens and, and people in their 20s and you're going to see vastly greater effects. This has, I believe, huge political implications. Because we have a lot of people who feel, a lot of young men who feel, that they're not functioning the way they expect and the way other people expect. And they are you know, looking for people to, to blame for it. Unfortunately, they should be blaming the telecom companies, but they're not doing that. So this has this has a huge, huge political implication. It also has implications for the whole structure of the society. Um, anyway, I you know I I guess I tell people the the more I learn, the worse things look. Um, and this is just another example of that. So yeah, um, you know they the, the, they are you know everything I learn about these things makes things much much worse. That's what that's why so few scientists. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, okay. Uh, 
you need old people like me doing this stuff. Yeah. People don't <coughs> people don't want to know or find out how bad things can be. Well, yeah. But I thank you all for being here because hopefully hopefully you can do something for your 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 country here. So, uh, big big thank you for both of our presenters today for all their efforts and hard work. Really appreciate it.